Thanks very much. And as you can see from the title, we don't want just a sustainable future. We want a sustainable and desirable future. We don't want to sustain the bad things that are, that are going on now. And I think that's part of what's uh, preventing everyone from taking off their shirts, if you will, and joining the movement. The movement has to be cast in a positive way. We have to create a positive vision. And I think that positive vision is not only possible, but I think it will, it will happen. We live in a new era. Part of the reason that this is so compelling and, and necessary is that we don't live in the empty world uh, that we used to inhabit, empty of humans and their, their artifacts, where there was always a frontier, where the, the incentives were always to capture more resources as quickly as possible and build your empire. That world has changed. We now live in a full world. We live in a whole new geologic era, according to some people, the Anthropocene, where we were having so much impact on the behavior of the planet that we don't live in the, the Holocene any longer. We live in a new geologic era. We have to come up with a whole new way of thinking about our place on the planet and what we hope to do if, in fact, we want to create the sustainable and desirable future. We recognize <clears throat> now more than ever uh, that we're facing biophysical boundaries uh, to the continued expansion of the human endeavor, at least in terms of its material and energy consumption. Uh, this is from a recent study that I was part of that tried to identify nine uh, uh, planetary boundaries and to define a safe operating space for humanity within those, those planetary boundaries. And as you can see from this diagram, the safe operating space we defined, which is the green circle in the, min in the middle, has already been surpassed uh, by at least three of these elements, climate change, biodiversity loss, and the nitrogen cycling. We need to get back within the safe guardrails that our finite planet allows us to operate within. That doesn't mean that we're gonna be constrained in the quality of our life. We're gonna be constrained in the quantity of material consumption and production, but that in fact is something that will benefit uh, the quality of our life. What we need now are solutions. We know, I think, what the, uh, what the problems are. We know where the boundaries are. We know what a sustainable and desirable future uh, should look like. At least we're in the process of creating that. And then we, we need to create that vision. And that, in fact, will, will, be, will guide us toward uh, solving this, sort of the biggest problem, I think, that humanity has faced uh, almost from the beginning. We know that solving these kinds of complex problems requires that we integrate these three elements of having an adequate vision, not only of how the world works, our scientific paradigms, which are certainly progressing rapidly, we're learning a lot more about how humans behave, what actually contributes to people's quality of life. We know that, it, that it's not material consumption, at least not beyond a certain point. Uh, we know how these complex ecological life su support systems function much better than we did. We need to apply all of that knowledge and create new paradigms, but we also need to have an adequate vision of how we would like the world to be, our positive vision of the future as the famous American Philosopher Yogi Berra once said, if you don't know where you're going, you end up somewhere else. We want to know where we're going. And I think our biggest challenge is really creating that vision of where we want to go and having that, having that guide our progression toward it. And having it guide the kinds of tools and analytical techniques that we use to understand our system and also have it guide the creation of new institutions and new networks that can help us to implement that vision. We also need to understand where we came from, I think in a much more detailed and complex and integrated way. We need to understand the interactions that have occurred historically with Homo sapiens and its interactions with the environment. As it's been said that if we fail to understand the past, we're doomed to repeat it. But I think what we can do really is to understand the past in order to create uh, a, a better and more sustainable and desirable future. We can't predict the future. Uh, or at least it's been said that the best way to predict the future is to create the future. That's, I think, what we need to do. <clears throat> we need to worry about these four major types of assets that contribute to human well-being, that have always contributed to human well-being. But two of these, at least, we've, we have uh, ignored recently. Uh, there's the traditional built infrastructure that we've been focusing on over the last several decades. But there's also human capital, not just human bodies, but all of the information and technology and health of individuals. But then there's social capital, all of the interactions between people, all of our networks and institutions and ways of interacting among each other. Humans are a social species, uh, fundamentally. And to ignore social capital, which we have been doing, 
I think is very detrimental to our, our current and our continued well-being. And finally, our natural capital, all of the natural ecosystems that contribute very much towards the survival and well-being of, of humanity and have been largely ignored. Um, if you try to take those types of capital into account and, and, uh, and try to estimate exactly how much they contribute to our well-being, you come up with some really astounding numbers. And we did this uh, several years ago to try to estimate the value of the world's natural capital and ecosystem services, the, the services that those, that those natural systems provide, and uh, estimated that to be in the range of 15 to 54. $54 trillion per year, much larger than global GDP at the time. So our natural capital assets contribute more than our conventional marketed uh, built capital assets. We're also discovering um, the impacts of social capital. And in this case, this is plotting income inequality on the x-axis uh, against an index of health and social problems uh, on the y-axis, all of these problems that are listed here life expectancy, infant mortality, imprisonment, trust, obesity, etc. And it shows that there is a very strong correlation between the level of inequality uh, and distrust in a society and this index of social problems. You can see the US way at the very top of the scale. You can see countries like Norway, Sweden, Japan at the very low end of the scale. So one way to fix these problems is really to reduce the gap in income uh, to approximate countries that have already shown that it can be done in this way. We also know that the relationship between income per capita on the x-axis and life satisfaction saturates at a fairly low level. So beyond a certain point, there is no reason to have more material consumption. It's not really adding to our sense of happiness and well-being. We've reached the point in many countries, not in all countries, certainly, where, where that strategy for improving our well-being is no longer a viable one. What we should be pursuing is a strategy of contraction and convergence, as it's sometimes called. We should put the, the obese economies on a diet to try to get back into shape. We should allow more consumption in the economies that, that need that consumption to get up to a level of material consumption that's sustainable and desirable. We know that if you start taking these kinds of things into account, you find you get a very different picture of how well our economy has been doing over the last several decades. Uh, we, we focus on GDP, but GDP doesn't measure uh, economic welfare. It was never designed to measure economic welfare. It only measures marketed economic activity. The oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico is adding to GDP because there's more people out there cleaning it up. There's lots of lawyers who are going to be paid to, to, uh, to work on this case after the fact. Not exactly an improvement in well-being. Other measures like the GPI or Genuine Progress Indicator take that into account, subtract the cost of that environmental damage and, sub and account for the changes in income distribution and make that, make that adjustment. You can see that since 1975, our genuine progress has not been improving at all in the United States, largely because of these, these trade-offs. So <clears throat> I think our most important challenge these days is to create and communicate a shared vision of a sustainable and desirable future. Um, several people have been working on this. One notably is uh, Dana Meadows, who came up with some principles for effective envisioning, and I'm listing them here. I won't read, th read through them all. But her point is that this is a process that we need to engage in as a society. In fact, you could argue that this is the essence of what democracy really should be about, is to have this conversation about what our shared vision is. What kind of society do we really want? We're not having that conversation now and we need to be having that conversation if we hope to achieve a sustainable and desirable future. <coughs> I shouldn't say uh, that it's not happening at all. There are some very <clears throat> important places where this discussion is going on and I list a couple of websites here. One, the Great Transition Initiative uh, which lays out four possible scenarios for the future. One called the Great Transition uh, which embodies many of the things that I've been, been talking about. We've done some workshops along these lines and it's very um, interesting that when you get people together and ask them the question, how would you like the world to be at some point in the future, forgetting about where we are now or where we seem to be headed, uh, there is a large degree of overlapping consensus. People do agree on the kind of world they want. They don't agree on necessarily the next steps. Uh, but, but building that consensus and communicating it, I think, will help us achieve that goal. 
Um, and I think it's important to recognize that cultures do change. Cultures change all the time. They have been changing throughout history, and they change sometimes very rapidly. Uh, they get to tipping points where things seem to change overnight. And um, I think that's being recognized. The, uh, the State of the World uh, report this last year was on this topic of transforming cultures. How do we transform our culture from one uh, of consumerism uh, to one of sustainability, the one that focuses on quality of life? Um, and you can see from this little graph up here uh, that, in fact, the, the number of people who, I think, are in hold this worldview called cultural creatives uh, that, that uh, take on board some of the, these ideas are expanding rapidly. Since the 60s, they've grown from almost nothing up until to now it's about 30% of the population. There may be a tipping point coming in our culture where that fraction of the population, um, probably many of the people in this room, is large enough to really uh, change things very significantly and very quickly. Of course, there are skeptics, uh, as there always are, uh, but I think this cartoon makes the point very clearly that uh, what if it's a big hoax, the climate skeptic is saying, and we create this better world for nothing? Let's create the better world. That's exactly what we need to do. I didn't follow the rules of Ted here and, and put a whole bunch of text on this slide, and I won't, uh, I won't belabor you by reading the whole thing, but I think the, the point here is that there's an existing model for development. It's focused on growth. It ignores scale and carrying capacity. It ignores distribution and poverty issues. It focuses completely on economic efficiency, but it doesn't worry about everything external to the market. It doesn't really worry about property rights other than trying to make everything private property. It tries to minimize the role of government and we should be very laissez-faire. That model, that paradigm, uh, that vision has to change. And it has to change rapidly, and I think it is changing rapidly to one that recognizes that we really need to focus on better, on quality of life, not quantity of consumption. We need to um, have better measures of that quality of consumption, better than GDP. Um, we need to worry about scale and carrying capacity and planetary boundaries. Um, we need to worry very, very um, directly about distribution issues uh, because that does affect our social capital and social capital affects our quality of life very dramatically in ways that we're only beginning to understand. We need to worry about efficiency and allocation, but we need to bring in all of the things that are external to the market into that allocation system, including our natural capital and our social capital. We need to build systems of property rights that can adequately uh, account for uh, our natural and social capital assets without privatizing them, but without leaving them as open access resources. And we need, I think, a new and more uh, diverse role for government. Um, not just as a regulator, but as a convener, as a facilitator, as a moderator in these, in these new institutions that we need to design based on a whole new, whole new set of principles of governance for sustainability. We need to make a transition to this new um, sustainable quality of life kind of economy. I'm still looking for the appropriate word for the new economy. Maybe it's the third millennium economy. Uh, maybe it's the Lagom economy. Lagom is a Swedish word that means everything, you get just enough. Everybody has just enough. Um, and what we need to do is not only uh, to convert our built capital infrastructure. We certainly need to do that. We need to convert to renewable energy and fairly quickly, high efficiency buildings, effective mass transit, etc. But we also need to fully utilize our human capital resources. Uh, we need to, to pursue full and, and fulfilling employment universal access to education through college and beyond, high quality uh, preventive health care, and limiting population. We need to rebuild our social capital assets um, by doing many things, including, including reducing the gap in income and wealth. And we need to restore our natural capital assets, <clears throat> including um, the climate and the atmosphere, but also uh, many of our other natural ecosystems uh, through a whole series of, of uh, techniques that we could use. Thanks very much.